here we go. We have Hollywood royalty in the building. Ernest Thomas, better known as Raj from What's Happening, and more recently, Mr. Omar, the funeral director on Everybody Hates Chris. Yes. Welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you. I've been looking forward to being here. Oh yeah, man! I'm a, I'm a longtime fan. Thank uh, you. I used to watch What's Happening as a kid because wow. the the syndication reruns just went on for years. Still, still, still? Going on. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm not four, surprised. Four times a night on TV one, then it's on Crackle and wow, yeah, wow, yeah. Just to show that that was it was so good that just continue to keep keep going on and yeah. on and on. Yeah, forty four years later. Still. Woo! Yeah. Well, this is your first time here, so yeah. I want to get into your whole story. Okay. So you were born in Gary, Indiana. Yes, born and raised, yeah. And uh, I guess your mother tried to abort you. Yeah, yeah. My mother had my sister at 16, you know, and uh, my uncles forced that guy, Robert Thomas, <laughs> to marry her. But he was still a, you know, philanderer. And uh, um, and uh, so, uh, that's the right word? It is philanderer. Philanderer, okay. yeah. So, uh, he, so she tried to get back at him by him by having an affair with uh, William Berry, and that's how I came about. But having gone through birth pain with, you know, at 16, she didn't want to go through it again. So she had the hanger. She was in the bathroom about to do the thing with the hanger, you know, because that's what they were told back then. She, one of her friends told her. And it just so happened my grandmother saw it and, and threatened her, and then that was and she, she, you know... She, then I came about, but she didn't. And she said, "She, I said, Mom, was that true? She, it is true. I tried to abort you because I just didn't want to go through the pain of, you know, the birth pain again. She tried to abort you yeah. with a coat hanger herself. Yes. In the bathroom. Yeah. So, and, and, and yeah, yeah, it was, just, it was in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. No, I'm sorry, Sykes in Missouri. And then they moved to Gary, and that's when I was born. But yeah, she tried to do it with a, a coat hanger. Yeah. Okay, that's crazy. That's, that's crazy. why I'm against abortion. Uh-huh. I know people have a right to choose, but I personally, mm. you know, I, I wouldn't be here if she chose not to have me. You know. Or you could have been here with major defects because <laughs> you had been poked. <laughs> oh, yeah, with that, a, that, yeah, that, yeah, that too. You could have been poked with a hanger in the head and yeah. brain damage or yeah. whatever else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I guess, you know, because you talked about how your mom had an affair with another yeah. man, but your father never knew it. Uh, no, no, no. He, uh, he, he, well, the, the guy, Robert Thomas was, she was married. It was my sister's father. Uh, William Berry knew that I was his child. Uh-huh. Yeah. So my sister is Robert Thomas. I took the name of Robert Thomas, but just because my mother, you know, was still married to him. But I'm really Ernest Berry, you know, uh, you know, by you know, because of my father's name. But, but because he was such a ladies' man, my grandmother told him, "We don't need you. I'll be the mother and the father." And so he tried to see me, but my grandmother uh, told him to go away. And I had some resentment about that because, you know, your father should be there and never, they would not reveal them until just recently, now that I'm 71, I went, really, mom? <laughs> you, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, you should go and find your father. And mom, he's dead. The man's probably dead. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Okay. So growing up in a situation like this, did you have a rough childhood or an okay childhood? I had a rough child. I wouldn't say rough. Yeah, I would say, yeah, because today kids commit suicide because of bullying. And when you're bullied by your own people, you know, uh, Charles Drew, uh, Charles Drew School, uh, Charles R. Drew's uh, grade school, um, because I was on welfare, you know, I did have the hand-me-down clothes that my work, my mother worked for these Jewish people. So I had the, uh, the shoes that were too tight, you know, I mean, you know, she could get clothes every now and then from this cheap place called This Is It. And they knew, everyone knew those clothes were from This Is It. In addition, I was thin, uh, and I was a church boy. So, uh, and then they said, I talked white. And all I did, all our teachers are black. I'm just imitating the teachers. So it's really rough when you're going to an all black school and you're being bullied. Every day there's something said, you know, are they taking your lunch money? Are they beating you in the chest? 
and because I am, thank God, I was in deep in the church and my, my faith in Christ, you know, from the time I was born, I, that's all I knew was Jesus Christ. So I had that faith that I knew God had me. And I saw in a way I felt sorry for them because I felt that he would punish them. Mm. But then you go to the South in the summertime and the, uh, then the vacation. And then you got the whites where you have to say yes, sir. And no, sir, to the white, even white kids because of Emmett Till, mm -hmm. that photo in Jet magazine, your mother, my grandmother and mother said, look, this is what happens. You know, so when you go to the South, even if it's a white kid, you say, yes, sir, and no, sir. So in that sense, yeah, you know, and I was an asthmatic for 18 years. But it's more the bullying and, 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 and then going to the South and going to the back of the restaurants and all that. Yeah. Well, you were, I guess, six years old when Emmett Till got lynched. Yeah. Do you remember that yeah. time? Oh, yeah. Well, they showed, they showed us, you know, because she made sure that you know they showed him in the casket as what as he was beat up you know but they beat him up so i mean he looks like a like something other than this world you know mm -hmm. and uh so my grandmother and mother made sure thank god she put that image in the jet magazine so we so we would not make that mistake because we knew that white men would definitely kill us if we say something something out of line yeah yeah i mean very a very messed up situation and then years later uh the woman who accused emmett till of whistling at her or whatever i guess before she died admitted that the whole thing was was fake that she Unbelievable. made it all up i know I, I i couldn't yeah all that time all that time all that time man yeah okay so you're growing up and i guess you're in the dory miller projects yeah dory miller projects and, uh, you know, started skipping school at one point and, you know, a little bit of a, of a bad kid. No, I only skipping school because of the bullying. Oh, because of the bullying. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Not yeah, because yeah, you yeah. didn't want to oh, go to school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And I, I guess at one point, uh, your mom got into a new relationship Yeah. with a man named JC. Yes. Well, you did your homework. Right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Who used to hit your mom all the time. Yeah, in the beginning, he did. Uh, I was 11 years old when she married him, and I didn't like him from the beginning. And uh, because I really, I, I, my mother, it was another guy that she was going to marry. Well, she actually did marry him. But uh, because of the whole color thing, the light skin, black skin, he was too dark. And her friend told her, her friend said, look, you know, this guy doesn't, you know, he's too dark to be with you. So basically my mother, she's ashamed of it now, but she actually divorced him because of that. Wow. So JC was light, lighter brown. Yeah. I, yeah. Cause colorism exists among us. And uh, so when she married JC, the first time I met him, she picked him up. She, uh, he picked her up and I was in the back seat and they got into an argument. So here he is hitting her and I, I'm, you know, I'm 11, what can I do? You know, I'm, I'm screaming and she's hollering for me. And uh, so I definitely hated him from then on. But then, thank God, my cousin Sydney, who was in like the, like a little mafia thing, you know, <laughs> uh, Sydney, you know, one mess with Sydney, he had killed people and got out like that, you know, so he was into something because he never went to jail for a long time. So when I told him about it, he came over and that ended that, you know, he came over on a Saturday morning, 8.30 in the morning, with pistol in hand, dressed to the T, trench coat. <laughs> you know, JC, did you, did you put your hand on my, my cousin? And he was, oh, and I felt, then I felt bad because I didn't want him to die, you know. So I'm pleading with Sydney because we know he'll pull that trigger, you know. And that was the end of that. And they became, they were like, um, you know, lovers from then on, you know, like soulmates from then on. Okay. So you graduated Pulaski Junior High, mm -hmm. and then you got sent over to an all-white high school. Yes, Jesus. Called yeah. uh, Emerson High School. Yeah. Who did not want us. Who yeah. did not want you. And yeah. I guess once you got there, some of the white parents had signs. Oh, yeah. And what did those signs Go say? Go back to Africa. Go back to Africa. Oh, yeah. They actually sat at home oh, and oh. made a sign. Oh, yeah. Oh, that yeah. said, go back to Africa yeah. for the black kids. Oh, yeah. How, how did that feel? I mean, because you're what, maybe 
14, 15 years yeah. old? Yeah. Oh, man, horrible. Because, you know, my sister, they sent her to the black school, you know, uh, with, with Roosevelt. And I don't know why they sent me to, you know, Emerson, you know. I don't know if I was just white friendly <laughs> or what, you know, but they sent me to, uh, but yeah, it was horrible. I mean, he had white kids. Actually, I remember this guy because he had piercing blue eyes and blonde hair. And, uh, and he was telling me that at the end of the year, that was the first year there was going to be some fights, you know, he said, but nothing against you, you know, but some of these black guys think they're bad and they're giving me trouble. So, but nothing against you personally. You know, but I can remember him even to this day, you know, but he wasn't like menacing. He just let me know that if you see me out there fighting, don't take it personal. against mm. you. OK, so then you graduate, you go to Indiana State University. Yeah. And there was a, a sociology professor that you had. Yeah. Who I guess was somehow connected to the Nazis. He was German. He was German. He got. He must have had some 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 Nazi descendants because he uh, the first day he said, "Hey, niggers, Jews, and many skirts in that in in that in that order," you know, and uh, hateful, hateful guy, you know. How does the class was it a mostly white kids? Oh or yeah, was... mostly white kids. Yeah. Okay, oh, so definitely. so they all just sort of. Were no one said nothing. It. No one. No one said a word. No one. No one was black. No one was a Jew. No, no one had a miniskirt, so it didn't really affect them. <laughs> so they, they laughed it off. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that being said today. In, in oh America. my god. Oh my. And then I had, I got a B. I thought I deserved an A on the paper. He gave me a B minus, and I went to him, and I said, I really think that you know you did this. You know, because of you know, and look, and Ernie, you know, yeah, you, you, you know, blacks deserve their rights, but they got to wait. You got to be patient. You can't have it overnight. You know, and he's just going through this whole patience, damn it, patience. You know, and and he's, you can tell they've been drinking. Mm. You know, uh, and I think they finally censored him after a while, but uh, and I don't know did he commit suicide. I can't. It was if something tragic happened. Mm. Which I'm sorry about. Even my worst enemy, I don't want no one to get hurt. You know, yeah. it's just not my thing. Okay. I mean, did that really just start to weigh you down? Just having years and years of this racist, you know, talk around you and making you feel less than and oh, so forth. Oh, sure. Oh, racism is a, a man. It's a bitch. It's really yeah. the the worst time though was going to Clarendon, Arkansas. And uh, my uncle's um, wife, her 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 mother had gotten had died, and we went down. He wanted me to come with him, and I love my uncle. So anyway, we had to go to a restaurant, and I'm going into the front door, and they went, no, 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 Ernie. I said, why can't we go? No, boy, come on, boy, you gonna you gonna get us killed? And and they were saying to me that only whites could could go in the front door, and we had to go around to the back, and there were actually cats eating in the corner hmm. and so that's when i that was that was the worst period and being yeah having a strong faith in god and all that and knowing that anything is possible i said lord make me white eight years old lord if you said all things are possible lord make me white so i can i don't have these problems anymore you can do anything if you're white you can go anywhere if you're white yeah sad sad time so in college, that's when you started acting. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 because of my friend Jake, uh, I had no interest in acting. Never wanted to be an actor, but I would make, I would do silly things. I'd play like I'm pregnant, you know. I would try to imitate people on TV, and so he saw me. He said, "Ernie, really, man, you're an actor. You can do anything those people do on television or in movies." So because of him, I went. I took an acting course, got an A in it. And that acting teacher actually told me, he said, look, you know, you can do this for a living. So I said, no, I'm going to be a social worker. But then when there was a play, Julius Caesar, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Romeo, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and Juliet uh, that was the first one. And then I, I, I auditioned for Prince Aeschylus and the director of it 
And these are all acting students. So I do my thing. So the director, he says, I don't know about y'all, but I'd like to hear that one more time. That's when I felt something was going to, but I still was convinced that I'm still going to be a social worker. I wasn't convinced to be an actor. Well, you ended up graduating yes. from uh, Indiana State University. Yes, yes. And you got a bachelor's of science degree in yes. sociology and psychology. Yes, yes. But then you went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts yes. in New York City. Yes, To yes. get your master's, basically? No, I had, I got, I was, did a year on, for my, on my master's at Indiana State. Ah. And then the acting bubble was so strong, I auditioned because Jake insisted that I do. Auditioned for the American Academy in New York, got accepted, and got my Associates of Arts degree from them, but for acting. Gotcha. And and this school is a big deal. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 75 Academy Award winners or nominees oh, came yes. out of the school, including uh, Robert Redford, Dan yes. DeVito, yes. Kim Cottrell, yes. Spencer Tracy. Yes. A lot of other a people. A lot of it, yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. So you're basically in the big leagues. Big league. When you're there. Absolutely. The first English-speaking school in the world. Oh. Acting school in the world. Oh, okay. Yeah, American Academy. So, so here you are in this environment. And are you excelling? Yeah, yeah. But you're always unsure, you know, as an actor. And you'll hear even great actors today that, that say they, how they doubt themselves because mm -hmm. we're constantly trying to be perfect. So, uh, yeah, the teachers are saying that I'm doing well and, there's, and I get a lot of love from my fellow students. Uh, but you knew you had made it when you get chosen before you come out of the school. You know, so I, I was doing a student play and I got chosen by, by Dan Freudenberger uh, to do a the a, called the Miracle Play with George, uh, with George, uh, Robert Guillaume and um, uh, oh, I can't get his name from from uh, oh from what's the film now? He won uh, Amba, from Amadeus. Mm. Uh, he won the Oscar. Uh, for Amadeus, where he they were the stars of it. So, but they don't usually give you uh, a leave because they figure you're not ready. But this guy was so, you know, he said, "Look, I I really think Ernie can do this." So they gave me uh, permission to leave school for that short run, and uh, and I got a great review from the Daily News, Kathleen Carroll. But then the jealousy set in, you know, from the other students. Okay, well, because you started to do Broadway at one point. Yeah, yeah, that was that was off Broadway. Yeah, and then uh, when I got when I finished uh, the acting, got my degree. Uh, Hal Prince chose me for a uh, member of the wedding, and Tony Perkins from Cycle Fame chose me for Don't Call Back. So it was like, you know, you were hot right then, you know. So that was that was awesome. Yeah. Okay, I mean, you're doing Broadway basically fresh out of school. Yeah, yeah, Big yeah. Deal. I, I, I mean, Big it's deal. like right, right, right in there, you know. Yeah. You know. Okay, so then you moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. To pursue your acting career. I wanted to be uh, on television because right. my mother and grandmother did not understand theater, mm -hmm. so I'm all excited about mom. I'm on Broadway, and they went Broadway. And what, baby? I come and pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm, no, no, Broadway, you know, you, the people sit there, it's like in the, like the church, but people sit, but you on the, and they, they didn't understand none of that, but they, right. they knew about, well, my grandmother knew about television. My mother never watched TV, but my grandmother loved Tom Jones. Mm -hmm. So she knew, she said, when are you going to be on TV, baby? So that's when I knew. And again, I, I believe in divine direction, you know, that, the, the, you know, uh, that God, uh, knowing that I wanted to be, have that, have, um, a TV show, and I really wanted to be Preacher Jackson from Cooley High, mm -hmm. but that had been done already. But I'm telling everyone, that's my part. That was my part. As God would have it, you know, uh, I happened to go at that time, right? And they were, I do the Jeffersons, and and an agent there, Isabel Sanford's agent, said, "Hey, get, there's, a, I think you'd be perfect for this new pilot called Cooley High." I mean, talking about divine. <laughs> You know, yeah. orchestration, you know. Okay. So you end up getting the role for Roger Raj Thomas yeah. on the show What's Happening, which is loosely based on Cooley High. Yes. The film. Yes. Yes. When you were auditioning, did you think you guys had something big on your hands or you weren't sure? Oh, yeah. I knew. I knew. Uh, now, we did 
There was a pilot that no one ever saw called Cooley High. No one has ever seen that. They, they you see photo photos of it now on on the internet. Uh, so that failed. So that was a disappointment. That's when I thought, well, well, maybe I was wrong, you know, because I just knew this was going to be a hit. But they said it wasn't funny enough. It was a um, one camera, you know, and uh, they had uh, the original guy from the uh, from the who played the uh, villain who killed Cochise mm -hmm. in there, and they had Garrett Morris as the teacher. We went to Chicago and shot stuff there, but. Uh, ABC said it wasn't funny enough and they said but Ernie you were amazing and so I, I just felt like a failure you know and then later they called and said well you know we're going to do a three camera we're going to keep you get rid of everybody else and cast another uh, group around you aha and that's how what's happening came that's together. how what's happening came about now on the show you were 25 years old playing a 16 year old yeah yes, <laughs> yeah because you're fairly skinny <laughs> oh yeah great genes i mean my niece now <laughs> is 50 and high school guys hit on her you know mm. yeah we have that in our genes i, I you know it's it, thank god yeah it worked you know yeah okay and you know there's a bunch of different actors on the show but you know one of the standouts was fred berry oh yeah aka rerun yes now Fred kind of had an interesting background before joining the show. Yeah. He was actually part of a, what I would call a breakdancing group yeah. called The Lockers. The Lockers, yeah. And, you know, as yeah. someone who was breakdancing, you know, in the 80s myself. Yeah? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, pop locking and everything yeah. was something we were doing. Yeah. And it really came from him. Yeah. He was the one that really invented a lot of that, you know, because... In the East Coast, the guys were more acrobatic right, and did right. a lot more floor work. Right. In L.A., in the West Coast, they were more kind of with the hand motions yeah, yeah. and the, you know, that type, That's of, true. That type of dancing. More yeah. of like the stylistic standing Ro up. Yes. You know, moon, yes. you know, uh, the robot and, yes, and whatever, absolutely. that type of thing. And he was really the inventor for a lot of that stuff. Well, no, Camelot, the, the, the guy who started the group. Okay. His name was Camelot. He actually was the guy that started all that, who recently died. But he's the one who brought Shabadoo and Fred Berry, all of them. That's his thing. And uh, he ended up doing exotic dancing. But uh, And I was told, <laughs> let people know, man, that this is you. Uh, but people thought Fred, no, Fred became, he taught Fred. And he taught Shabadoo. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. Camelot. Is Shabadoo from Breaking? Yeah. Who, Shabadoo who, was part of the lockers. Who recently yeah. died. Uh, yeah. God ha. bless him. Yeah. Aha. Okay, so it's all kind of interrelated. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Rerun kind of had that dance on oh, the show. Yeah. Was oh, there a yeah. name for it? Uh, I guess you said Lockin, you know, really. Okay. Yeah, Pop Lockin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you know, this group comes together. Um, you know, uh, Shirley, Shirley Hemphill yeah. is, was, you know, played the waitress. Yes, yes. At, yes. The, at the diner. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Mabel King yeah. was on it. Yes. Uh, a lot of different people. Haywood Nelson. Haywood Nelson. Know, played, uh, Dwayne. Yeah. 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 Uh, your brother. Yeah. Uh, yep. No, he was like a, a little buddy. Little buddy. Of oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. You're right. And Danielle Spencer, D. You know, don't forget D. Yeah. Got it. So this show comes out and it gets great ratings. Yeah. Yeah. So now you have a hit TV show. Mm -hmm. Now, were you considered the star of the show or the co-star or? They said that. I would never say that. Shirley would say that. Other people said that. I always wanted to be an ensemble. But yeah, my I was a lead actor. Uh, but I, I never wanted to. I never said that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're doing the show. But I am the, the star of the show. Yeah. What the, the hell? The, there you go. <laughs> star of the show. <laughs> so you, you start the show and you guys have a big first season. Yeah. And it gets renewed yeah. for, uh, was it three seasons? Three seasons, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How did it feel to do those three seasons? Oh, it's like heaven on earth, you mm. know. I mean, you know, you come from obscurity uh, because Broadway, no one really knows you, you know. I mean, as far as the world stage. But, you know, uh, you do what's happening and people that you admire, you know, Sidney Poitier, Dr. Maya Angelou, Muhammad Ali. So people you admire now are coming, are saying that you're it. You know, mm -hmm. so it was definitely and just being recognized anywhere you went, you know, people giving you that love, you know, yeah. white, black, Asian, whatever. We really had, you know, we really got a global attention, you know. Yeah. 
Well, while doing the show, you actually auditioned for Roots. Yes. As a yes. Kunta Kinte. Right, yeah. Which you ended up, I guess you were like one of the two runner, you know, final actors. Yeah, the two, just LeVar Burton and I. LeVar yeah. Burton got it, unfortunately. Yeah. But you actually had a role in it as well. Yeah, yeah, because they loved the screen test. So they loved the screen test, and I wish I had kept that, but I was so upset and crying about, no one knew that, but I cried alone. I bet. Uh, but I had what's happening, but I wanted that role so bad. And uh, so they created that role uh, for me while we would be in the beginning scene talking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, the um, manhood training, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, we interviewed John Amos who played the adult oh, Kunta Kinte my Lord. In, that, yes. in that film. Yes. And, you know, I, I think what everyone doesn't really, you know, may not realize was that up until Alex Haley yeah. really wrote that book, there was no black history really anywhere. Yeah. It was literally just brushed under the, you know, yeah. under the table. Absolutely. There was no stories of slavery. No, no. That Literally, it's almost as if it didn't happen. Absolutely. But he started to write these stories. Yes. I think for Reader's Digest originally. Yes. It then got made into a book. Yes. And then it got made into a movie. Yeah. And, you know, in 2021, when there's dozens of, of oh, movies yeah. about slavery, yes, yeah. that was the first one. Yeah. First and it was one. a big production. Yes. It was a mini series. It was on a major network. Yes. And everyone wanted everyone to watched that. Everyone watched that, man. That one yeah. week, or I think it was like a whole week, that it was, uh, I've never seen it. Oh, you never watched it yourself? I can't watch slavery. I can't deal oh, with it. Yeah. yeah. I, I have lied all this. I'm revealing to you for the first time. I've been lying to everybody. <laughs> I have never <laughs> seen Roots ever. Well, I can say that now. Because I could not take seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. I, I try to watch the new one. Yeah. Uh, Will Power ended up creating a new series. And that was too hard to watch as well. Oh. I think that one even was even more brutal. Was it? That. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I had no... Yeah. Well, uh, in the middle of doing the show, uh, you end up moving out to Malibu. Yeah. Uh, with your brother. Yeah. Uh, and he came out as gay. Yeah, yeah. And ended up transgender, but yeah, gay first. And yeah. God bless him. You know, you would love him if you had met him. Yeah. Uh, were you surprised when he told you that? Yeah, yeah, because he was a, you know, he had all these girls, you know, he had the one. <laughs> and I remember because he was telling some girl, like, she said, uh, you know, you know how to, you know. He said, baby, I was born fucking, you know, <laughs> type that. So, so and, uh, and, you know, he was well endowed. So the girl, you know, was boasting about that. And so, I, to me, he was just a ladies' man. But then later on, you know, and he was a dancer, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. not saying that that makes you whatever. But he um, then he expressed to me that he, I guess, was doing both. Then it was like, well, I'm all the way, you know. Okay. Yeah. And then he actually became transgender. Yeah. In the end, it was transgender. It was really difficult for him huh. because of the family's rejection. Yeah. Oh, so your family kind of disowned him? Over no, there? they wouldn't disown him. They just, they, they, it was a hard time accepting the gay thing. Uh -huh. So they finally got around to that because my mother, you know, God bless her, but it's like the Bible, 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 right? Mm -hmm. But then she said, okay, but that is my son. Okay, I love you. Now, I don't agree with your lifestyle. And then when he um, well, caught pneumonia, was in a coma for eight days. And they thought he was, they told me that to pull the plug, but he wouldn't live, you know, take him off life support. But a miracle happened. He woke up. Hmm. So then he said, okay, now I'm not living my life for no one again, for no one else but me. And by the way, I want to be your sister. Right. And so the family just, when he had that ceremony, he was a ceremony that he became transgender and it was huge. Bishop Bean Church, it was like 500 people, hmm. gay and lesbian, and uh, it was huge. Uh, and I was the only one. No one came. I was afraid he would commit suicide because a lot, they have a high suicide rate. And so I knew that I needed to come, you know. Yeah. Did he change his name after he became president? Yeah, his, Tony Sue Farrell. Uh -huh. Yeah, instead of T-O-N-Y, it was T-O-N-I-I. -I. Uh -huh. Yeah, Sue Farrell. He ultimately died of AIDS. Uh, yeah, with the yeah. pneumonia complication. Yeah, with the, the, the pneumonia didn't, have, you know, he was out there party. He, it was drugs, all that combined, yeah. yeah. Was that tough to watch your brother kind of deteriorate 
Bro, well, he amazing. wasn't. No, he didn't. He really wasn't. Oh. It was he, he didn't. He was still had his whole body weight and all that. He had it, but it had not kicked into that level. Uh, so he didn't realize he had it. And, uh, yeah, he knew he had oh, it, he but he, he didn't it. have the physical deterioration. Uh-huh. No, okay. he just was out there partying and uh, went to emergency, and he died there. Heart, and then the heart gave out. Uh, my sister and my mother thought, well, they killed him. You know. Because black folks, we get, we get into that like, how did he die all of a sudden in emergency? But you know, he, he he, that's what happened. Yeah, I mean, this is before the the AIDS cocktail drugs. Yeah, and the, yeah. Uh, Truvada. Oh, that, yeah. And, oh, and now. Convivir yeah. and all the stuff that's keeping oh, the Magic yeah. Johnsons sure, alive. You sure. know, back then, if you had it, it was a death sentence. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I guess uh, Shaka Khan would stop by the house. Oh, Shaka, yeah, Shaka Khan came over in a string bikini. <laughs> and I'm totally, you know, I'm starstruck still, right? You know? And she came over with her daughter who was six years old, and she's, "Hi, I'm Shaka Khan." You know, I was like, "Can I get in your pool?" And went, uh, yeah, 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 okay. And then calling me, guess what, Shaka? Khan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she became um, she came, became over all the time. You know, good friend and sweet lady. Yeah, uh, we interviewed her not too long ago. Oh. Uh, Lunell actually did it. Oh, yeah, she, okay. She, she, yeah. I, I was ta- starstruck. Oh, like, yeah. Literally, I was oh, watching yeah, this man. interview just starstruck. Yeah, <laughs> seeing this. Yes, yes. Okay, so here you are. You got a hit show. You got a house in Malibu. You're partying. Yeah. Celebrities are coming over. And then in 1979, the show gets canceled. And you didn't even know it was coming. No. Found out from a newsstand guy. Wow. <laughs> You know, so here you are, and you're kind of you know this is your identity at this point. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're Raj. Yeah, <laughs> from right. Good, you know, from yeah. what's happening. Right. And now you're canceled. Yeah. And you went into a depression over that. Oh yeah, yeah. Major depression, more drugs, because coke. I've been introduced to coke at that time, and Remy Martin. So those were the go to, you know, and of course weed, all of it, you know. Well, and uh, and crack. Yeah, which came in the 80s, though. Uh-huh. Yeah, that came in the 80s, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, like the end, like like 1980, like 79, 80, yeah. Yeah, yeah right yeah. around that time. Yeah, actually, you, you're right. Yeah, yeah. the freebasing happened right out. Yeah, yeah, it did happen. Yeah. What was it like to, to start smoking crack and, and really go down that rabbit hole? Well, you know, people got to quit lying. It is an awesome feeling. You know, uh, that free base is like that ecstasy, but it's a two-faced drug, you know. It's, it's the angelic, and you have this euphoria, like, oh, my God, I want to feel this way all my life. But then <laughs> that downside, then the devil comes, yeah. right? And every thought, every evil thought, everything that bothered you, every childhood memory, everything anyone said to you comes up, huh. and you feel less than crap. Well, yeah. Well, I guess you and Red Fox were really close. No, I never did. Yeah, he, I was too scared to do it with Red Fox because I knew he's a millionaire. Yeah. And he would say, hey, you're my son now. Come on over, you know. But I was smart enough not to come over because I knew being a millionaire, I would end up dead there because if, with all the coke he could afford, I would free face <laughs> myself to death. Oh, because he was using as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Would he try to get you clean? No, no, no. I, we never even discussed the ah, drug. okay. Uh-uh. But, but I knew he did it. He knew I did, but we never talked about it. I knew if I went over there, that was going to be the end of it. Yeah. Well, here you go from having this house in Malibu and, you know, partying and making all this money to, you know, losing the show or well, the show gets canceled. Yeah, yeah. And then you had to move back in with your sister. You got, yes. We got evicted, actually. I actually got evicted. Yeah. yeah That's a to, horrible feeling. You too. had to move back uh, in with your sister. Yeah. With no money. No money. Yeah. And uh, I guess when the syndication checks were coming in, you just started using it on drugs. Yeah. At first, I was, I was being good because I, you know, I had become Muslim in 1977, which didn't help with my Jewish producers or my Christian... Um, castmates so i caught hell with that alone so when when the uh when the ju- when the show was canceled i got back into trying to pray again you know after i got you know i look let me, i got to get off these drugs and i started praying and 
uh, when I was when I got with my sister, just the clean up, you know, because I knew that that was the initial thing that got me off drugs in '77. Was uh, my cousin brought this Muslim guy over and. And uh, I needed something, you know, as Christians would say, well, why didn't you? I said, you guys are too busy getting high to talk about Christ. <laughs> and my Jewish producer said, well, why didn't you come? Jew you never asked me to be Jewish, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so I got a lifesaver from a Muslim and that's what happened. So I started, you know, trying to, you know, keep the, you know, I was on the straight and narrow praying, have my white robe on and all that. And then when the residual checks came in, you know, that, that had that little, that little itch, you know, <laughs> the tribal, you know, kicked in again, and you got, got back. The on white again. lady, you know. Yep. And I guess at one point you ended up having to stay at the YMCA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah, that was where I stayed at the YMCA, which was like a basically a homeless shelter. No, uh, they just have rooms there. Well, yeah, yeah. So it's one step above. A, right. A yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they, it's just a regular place, but they have places where people can stay. And yeah. I didn't even know that, but someone told me about it, and um, I ended up staying there for till Muhammad Ali rescued me. Okay, so then you run into Muhammad Ali. I guess at a magic shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I prayed on him again. The importance of prayer and visualizing what you want. And so when I was with the drug dealer getting high at the free basin, he felt sorry for me. He said, man, you know what? You need to get with Muhammad Ali. I bet he like you. So I said, yeah. So I, so I started getting photos of Ali. I would bring photos into my room, get magazines on Ali. I put it all on the, in, the, in the room and on the, on the table. And in two weeks, less than that probably, uh, we went to Hollywood, a friend, uh, uh, just because we were bored, and, and parked on the side street. And I remember this lady comes over. She didn't call me Roger. And then she says, hey, Ali's at the magic shop. And it looks like it's closed because the gate is closed. But just open. It's not locked. Just open it up. Hmm. And my friend looked at me and said, you're a warlock. You know? <laughs> you're a war I said, no, this is the power of Christ. So anyway, I go in there, uh, and Ali is doing the magic tricks. And uh, and everyone's recognizing me and Raj and Ali gives me this look. I don't know if you have you ever met Ali, but if he looks at you a certain way, a stern, he can give you a look, man, that makes you feel like you're about a foot tall. Hmm. So he looked at me like I'm the one here, you know. So I said, "Hey, no, 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 no more autographs. I'm here for Ali, you know. I'm here for Ali." And uh, and uh, he couldn't have been more gracious and and said, uh, "Do the laugh." You know what I'm saying? He just <laughs> he don't he don't make a sound like he just you know he just laughs like so do it again do it again ah! and and uh, I said you don't watch what's happening he said yeah I watch the show I love that show you know so who would who would think that Muhammad Ali watched what's happening you know well I guess he he gave you his phone number. Yeah, he gave me his phone number, uh, said, do you need anything? And, of course, I was too proud to say I did. I said, no, I don't need it. He asked me right then and there. And huh. I was with a friend who knew one. We were staying at the YMCA. So the friend looked at me, what the hell? And I said, oh, no, I'm good. I'm just here to see you, champ. I just want your autograph, man. That's all I need. And he looked at me like, he gave me that look like, you're full of it, right? Well, here, that's when he gave me the number, in case you ever do. You know, okay. and it took me three months uh, to humble myself. And you called him. Yeah. He put so you in a hotel room. He yeah. put you in a hotel room. But yeah, he had, well, he asked me to stay at the mansion. Ah, but really? when his wife looked at me, he didn't see her, but she was behind him, and she looked at me like, "Nigga, I wish you would. <laughs> I wish you would." And I went, "Uh, no, you know, I'll leave. You can put me up somewhere else, you know." But he asked me to actually stay in the mansion. Wow. So then he put me in a kitchenette at the Vine Street Vine Hotel, Vine Street Hotel, right there on Vine, you know. And, uh, well, and he actually paid for your uh, eye surgery. Yeah, everything. Yeah, he basically underwrote everything. Like, look, wow. I'm supposed to help you. Joe Frazier helped me when I didn't have anything. So I'm supposed, don't look at it like, you know, I'm just another nigga trying to get bigger. Don't look at me as something bigger than that, you know. I'm I'm supposed to help you. That's this is for my for my for my place in heaven. My rent I have to pay. I have to give back. Right, because Ali was was Muslim himself as well. Yeah, he was, yeah. Uh, eventually, he became a Sunni a Sunni Muslim, right? Yeah, yeah. 
And so did you guys connect on that level? Oh, we did. But, you know, initially he didn't know nothing about that. Uh-huh. You know, he just, we, I, I never mentioned that. Oh, okay. He, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, he was just a fan of the show. And then when I got to the, the, to the mansion, then I mentioned, you know, that I had a Muslim name and all that, but and he was not, in, he said, so what's your Muslim name? I said, Luke Mahan, Muhammad Al-Ghazali. He went, yeah, that's deep. <laughs> And everyone starts <laughs> laughing, you know. <laughs> and I went, damn it. You know, but yeah, so that's, he only knew after the fact, you know. Okay. And you actually uh, went on his uh, Muhammad Ali World Hunger Tour. Yes, yes. As a speaker yes, yes. later on. So do you guys kind of maintain a relationship after that? Oh, yeah, yeah. He he really considered me, well, we became really friends when I called him up for a check. I said, hey, Ali, you know. Hey man, I need uh, some money for it or such such a thing. I don't know what it was at the time. And he went, he said, "Yeah, everybody want money, you know. They, you know, they can't go to, they wouldn't go to Sammy Davis and so and so and so and so. They know I'm gonna do it because I have a big heart, but no one thinks about my problems." I said, "I'm here. I, 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 I could, I, I'm, I'm, I can be a friend. I, I, I love you, man." I said, just I said, I love you. You can tell me about your problems, and that's when we connected. Uh-huh. And then he told me things I would never tell anyone. But I can say one thing for sure: he had a legal yellow pad of all the people he was paying things, you know, paying their bills and huh. their mortgages and car notes, and these are old cronies and all that. And uh, he did feel used, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I uh, when I interviewed, I believe Larry Holmes. And we talked about Ali's last few fights because Holmes ended up fighting him. Yeah. Really almost against his will. Yes. You know, he talked about how in the fight, you know, he wasn't even punching him. He was like open hand slapping him and was asking the referee to stop it. The referee told him shut up and box. And he cried (laughs) afterwards. I heard that. About it. And I remember I asked him, I said, you know, because you watch these you know, because Ali was a little bit before my time. You watch these documentaries, and the, the fast-witted, sharp, you know, yeah. fast-talking Ali by the end was not there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The the Parkinson's or the brain damage, the CTE, whatever you want to call it, right, was already right. setting in during his yeah, last yeah. few fights, where he was talking very slowly yes. during the pre, you know, the pre-fight yes. interviews. Yes. And yes. I said, you know, why why do you think he kept? boxing because he made so much money he said well but he also spent a lot of money Mm -hmm. and you know i guess part of the spending is paying for everyone else yeah well i disagree with him on that oh really yeah it's not it was he didn't keep fighting for the money his ego Uh aha because he had 14 million you know he he was telling me again he said look i had i don't know what happened he said i made 60 million why do i only have 14 million but he didn't want to accuse anybody So he had, no, he had, but he said, he said, fame is a drug. Huh. And that you you still want that attention. He would go out deliberately just to get that, all that, you Ah, know, fanfare. He was was addicted to that. All that love, you know, on purpose. And his wife talked about that. You know, Veronica even mentioned that, that he would, he still missed that. You know, and we went to the Tyson fights together, and uh, he would get more applause than Tyson. That was the drug, <laughs> ah, you know. Yeah. He missed that drug. Uh, it was not. It was not financial. I know that for a fact. Really? Okay. You know? Well, that's that's news to me. I yeah. Mean, I, that's that's an yeah. actual interesting perspective of it. How did you feel when he died a few years ago? Oh man, saddest day ever. I mean, even before that, you know, Ali seeing him not being able with the Parkinson's. Because a guy I knew was was quick witted and and full of jokes and pranks, you know. And uh, I remember at May May's wedding, at his daughter's wedding, that's when I first saw it. And she told me, uh, "Look, look, mom, when you see dad, uh, don't mention anything. Don't feel sorry for him. He's gonna get upset with you. Just act like you don't know it." And I yeah. thought I was prepared. And then when I saw him. I know, hey, I said, oh my God, I got to use the restroom, you know, and I went in that stall and I cried like a baby. It was so sad. Yeah. That was sadder to me than the death. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my dad died of Parkinson's from a, like a year and a half ago and 
the worst part about Parkinson's is that the brain is still fully functional. But the body just starts to give out. Oh my god! And you you have that. you literally start to lose control of of your muscles and your Ooh. everything else like that, and it's just a Lord Jesus. a sad deterioration. So yeah, I, I could definitely relate to that situation. Man. But you know, he went down as you know he may not have had the greatest record ever, but he went down as the greatest boxer ever yeah. because of everything he did outside yeah. of the ring oh yeah just as a humanitarian yes. you know he he went and got hostages that reagan couldn't get you know mm. remember he went over there yeah. to saddam hussein look i want the hostages okay ali you know <laughs> there you go champ. And, yeah there you go yeah. you know and he gave to the jewish uh senior citizens home he gave to he gave to everybody he gave christians uh yeah. land to build their churches on he was more like Christ as a Muslim than any Christian I've ever met. Well, uh, while you're doing the show, mm -hmm. you start doing other projects. Mm -hmm. And one of them was a, a piece of action with uh, Sidney Poitier and oh, yeah. Bill Cosby. What was it like working with, uh, with Bill Cosby? <sighs> Whew. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bill Cosby, I admire him as a comedian. I think he's hilarious. I, you know, especially in uh, Let's Do It Again, uh, the Cosby Show. As a person, I did not like him. Uh, he was not like he was not friendly to me or to the Fred Berry and Haywood and I. You know, again, I didn't want to go to prison. We went to prison. I cried about that, but I'm just be keeping it real. Mm -hmm. All right, he was not nice to me, so I did not like him. So we we had to our show was a top ten. Bill Cosby had a show called a variety show called Cos that was sucking in the ratings, like 69 in the ratings. <laughs> they brought us to come and build his ratings up. So we on the set, you know, and we have this um, this song about school days, schoolwork, you know, how important schoolwork is. And we got the song and dance. And we, we and when we're done, we wait for him because we see him talking to somebody, a producer or whatever. And we like, oh, we can't wait. This is Bill Cosby. And so he he comes by us smoking that big ass cigar, and we go, Mr. Cosby, Mr. And he keeps going, Mr. Cosby, Mr. He didn't does not look at us. He's this close hmm. and keeps going. Never once we're young black actors. You know we know how hard it is. This is a miracle we even have a show. You know. And your old ass should come in there and say, hey, guys, hey, hang in there. God bless you or something. But it was the arrogance. He was incredibly arrogant. Yeah. But yet I still didn't want him to go to jail. Yeah. I mean, and you heard this a lot with, with young black comedians and actors. Yes. Where Bill really looked down on people who he felt were not you know, sophisticated enough yes. in their form of comedy. Yes. You know, um, yes. you know, for example, Earthquake talked yeah. about how he was on Def Comedy Jam and C Cosby basically denounced the entire show. Wow. As as low grade, you know, low level black comedy and, oh you know, the type of joke shouldn't be made and it sets black oh people my. back. And, you know, and this was the only show really for comedians. Of, right, right. You know, and I, I kept hearing this story of Deal Hughley who told yeah. me a different, he yes. got to do with Cosby. Yes. The yes. same type of thing that he basically just put a lot of black, you know, c celebrities and entertainers mm -hmm. down. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to bringing them up yeah. if they didn't really conform to what he felt. Yes. Eddie Murphy. He did Eddie Murphy. Thing, Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. A lot of people. A lot of people. Um, okay, so the show gets canceled. Yeah. And then in 1985, they bring it back. Well, I, I, I bring it, I take it to Herman Rush because Ali told me, stop whining about what you don't have. You know, and I said, well, I have this idea for a, a what's happening, a new what's happening. And I said, but I can't get an appointment. He says, why not? I said, well, you have to call. He said, there are no rules. There are no rules. Go there. And go over there and see that president of the of, of Sony TV. So I, I I follow Ali's rule. I go there and they, they didn't ask me. They just said, oh hey hey Ernest you know what I said, I'm here to see Herman Rush. Oh go right in it. So Ali was right you know. So I go in there and I have the treatment. And Herman Rush uh, he was in a hurry at that time. Rush <laughs> he was <laughs> no pun intended. But and so the secretary told me 
what do you have? I said, well, this is a treatment for a new what's happening. She said, but write a letter, though, with it, why you think it should be, you know. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the letter. Then he sent me a letter back saying that, uh, I'm sorry, Ernie, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but there's no audience or new what's happening, you know. And then his wife, uh, 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 he told his wife about it. She said, well, do your research on it. And they found out that what's happening was more popular in reruns than it was on primetime. Mm. And I didn't even know that. So that's when they brought it, you know, all the way back. So if I, if I had not initiated that, and that was not the cast believing in it, everybody thought I lost my mind. I was doing a letter writing campaign. I mean, uh, uh, for the uh, for the show, I went to the mayor of Gary, Indiana. I said, look, you owe me. You know, I've come <laughs> here, help you with your campaign. I need you to have a press conference and say you're here to be the first signature on bringing what's happening back. Uh, but the cast didn't believe in it. I lost my manager, my agent because of that, you know. Uh, and I asked one of the, I asked a writer from Jefferson's, I said, man, would you help me write the script? And he said, Ernie, I'm sorry, but Amos and Andy would come back before that. So I was, <laughs> everyone thought I had lost my mind. But again, that's why I said, Lord Jesus, I thank you, John 14. 14, 12, ask anything in God's name, in Jesus' name, it is true, you will get it. They call out of nowhere. So I'm in Compton, California at a sandwich shop, you know, and I was doing some uh, acting workshops out there. And the agent had called me. Um, my mother said that, because the, the guy there, they had his number. And he said, they said, um, uh, the agents, at, my agent wanted to talk to me. So, a green vine agency and God bless them, you know, and uh, they said, Ernie, are you sitting down? I said, no. Well, guess what? They're going to do what's happening again. It's called what's happening now. It's going to be two years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, about, I did have that, well, you almost faint, that fainting <laughs> feeling because you've been told there's no audience for it, right? Everyone think you're nuts and now it's going to happen. Yeah. So what's happening now starts off in 1985. Yes. Yeah. Now, originally, Rerun is part of the cast. Yes. But I guess uh, he wanted a million-dollar deal, and he wanted more money than everyone else. That ego. I love him. And he apologized before he died, but someone had lied to him. Mr. Cocaine, that Freebase will lie to you. <laughs> so that <laughs> Freebase, you, you, get the the, yeah, you the star of the show, baby. Without the fat man, there's no, there's no show. <laughs> So Fred is going for it. And he, Ernie Byrne, I'm sorry, Ernie Byrne, without me, there's no show. So he wanted his million dollar deal. You know, it was like MDD. And he was going to uh, MTV and he was, he tried to go on the lot of Sony, you know, and they wouldn't let, they wanted to burn the contract there and all that. And uh, so that's how Martin Lawrence ended up coming. Right. Out. So Martin Lawrence somewhat replaced him, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Martin Lawrence and Ken Sagos. And, um, yeah. Was that Martin Lawrence's first TV His gig? Very, first thing. First thing ever. He had just done uh, Star Search, but he ah. didn't win. He didn't win Star Search. So his, his first professional gig was What's Happening okay. Now. Yeah. Did you see the star power early on? I didn't see that. Okay. Yeah. God bless him. You know, but Mr. Needmo. When you when you get hungry enough, Mr. Nemo will bring things out of you. <laughs> that you when you up against the wall, you know, as an artist, things will come out of you that you didn't even see. And I think that's what happened because this guy we saw later, no way, you know. He got yeah. his chops up. Yeah. Okay, so the show went from eighty five to eighty eight. Yeah. When it was finally, uh, you know, when it finally ended, was that a sad day as well? Yeah, back to the drugs, back, back to the freebase, baby, you know? Yeah, very sad day. So you started getting high again. Getting high again, because I, I didn't realize I had made this show like a god, you know? Because that's the second time, you know, again, when it, when that failed, I'm back there again, you know, with the drug dealers, because, you know, as a celebrity, you get more drugs, you know, because of who you are, you know? And if they're fans, you really get, you know. So back again, which is horrible. Because now you're feeling twice as bad as the first. Because, you know, God gave you this second chance. And now here you are back mm -hmm. on this crack, you know, again. So, What do you think was the worst thing you did, you know, 
for the drugs or while high on drugs? I think being going to think uh, I was getting high with you know pimps and prostitutes, uh, pimps and hoes. They said were my best audience. They were my my fans, number one fans. That's what they, they did, but the Christians didn't do, the Muslims didn't, all the friends and relatives, the pimps and prostitutes would, would just love on me, you know? And uh, because the show was always on too, you know, they loved, they wanted me to come by and I avoided them. But finally, you know, I'm like, oh, hey, how you doing? But I'm not trying to be with them, but they took me in and they gave me money. They showed me the pistol that anyone messed with you, let us know. You know, hey, man, you're funny. You're going to get another show. You're going to get it again. You know, so they were doing what and the others weren't. So, uh, which Ali hated. He he tried to do an intervention to get me from, like, I heard you and out there and I lied to him. So I wasn't, I wasn't getting high. I wasn't getting high with drug, with the pimps and the prostitutes, which I was. Uh, so then because they're so paranoid. I wanted to be alone. So I think the worst thing that, and, and only God kept me alive. I went to a hotel, I won't name, with, tell you which hotel, but I said, I need to be high by myself. So, cause I'm, I'm calm when I'm high. I'm not all over the place. You know, mm -hmm. I, I listen to music. I try to get, you know, listen to music or something or porn, you know, something to get my <laughs> attention off yeah. of the fact that, you know, all that, cause you start being distracted. So being in a hotel, freebasing alone by yourself. Now the fear is, are they going to smell it? You know, uh, are they going to knock on the door anytime now? Are the police going to come and put me in jail? But initially, you, you know, the high, you know, makes you oblivious to all of that. But then that paranoia kicks in. So now you've had, you have this, you're in the hotel, like, oh, good. No one's here with me. I can get high by myself. Great. And then you come down. The drugs, when the drugs are gone, you coming down off of it, you know. But I knew by then, being a pro, you had to have like weed, you have a little weed, you gotta have some sleeping pills, you know, because you'll be up, you know. So, but then you take the sleeping pills. Now the fear is that, well, I die in my sleep. Mm. So even it, so it, it, it's, it's, it's like, it's just total hell, you know. And, and then when they were trying to make me, you know, my agent wanted me to do stand up, and I was was doing stand up. Uh, I did like had fifteen minutes of stand up because Shirley Hemphill saw that in me. I didn't see that in myself, and I got accepted by Missy Shore, the Comedy Store, and and so then I went to was in New York, and the agent said, "Look, they want you at such and such a place in Greenwich Village," uh, and I went. I'm still. At that time, I stopped the coke, stopped drinking the coke. I mean, taking the uh, the free base, but I was drinking hardcore, absolute uh, vodka, you know, uh, and Remy Martin still. And uh, so I didn't want to do that show, and I kept drinking and drinking. And by the time I got there, I was so out of it. Or the lights in this, you know, New York has all all these lights, and the lights were just dancing. I was just so high. And I realized I can't do it. I'm crying. I don't want to do stand up. You know, uh, all I have is 15 minutes. They want me to do an hour. I don't have an hour, you know. And uh, so I asked someone, can you take, tell me how to get back to 888 8th Avenue? That's where I was living. And uh, that's when I fell down. And um, uh, when I got to, the, to my, I was staying with these friends who weren't there. And I got on my knees and I said, Lord, you know, even as I even as I speak to you, I want some. You know, I could I want the free base. I want all of it, but I know I'm gonna die if you don't intervene and take this away from me. You know, and 30 years later, you know, uh, and I admire people in AA and CA, but for me, it was Jesus Christ. He took it, and I have not looked back since. Wow. Yeah. So for 30 years, you've been clean. 30 and sober. years. Amazing. Yeah. Well. Some years later, in 2003, Fred Berry dies. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he was having the drug use as well, right? Yeah, 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 man. Yeah, yeah. I think he had a, a stroke. He did. And then as he was recovering, he ended up dying. Uh, he was married six times to four different women. Yes. yes. Two of which he had married twice. Yes. <laughs> I miss him so much. He was a rascal, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And his kids look just like him. Oh, do they? Yeah. Well, he has a girl, the daughter who I'm close to, and he has a son. They look just like him. Yeah. Crazy. They dance like him? Huh? Uh, I think they say the boy does. Okay. I heard that. I got to see yeah. that. 
you know, uh, you had mentioned Gary, Indiana. That's where Michael Jackson yeah. came from as well. Yeah. You know, and you going back there all the time. Was there any interactions with any of the Jacksons? Or I met them out here. I mean, in in, in California through Ali. I went to see uh, Lena Horn. They were sold out, and I said, Ali, I got to go and see Lena Horn. And people gave up their seats for Ali, of course. <laughs> and Michael was there, and he runs from the first first row. Ali! Ali! And so Ali says, uh, you know, Raja? You know, Raja? He will not call me Ernest for nothing, man. So... <laughs> <laughs> You call me by your stage he name. Called, hey, he called me all the time. <laughs> so and and Michael was a fan, you know. And I knew that the, his family because Janet came by when we had the Doobie Brothers on, hmm. and she was doing Penny on Good Times and got yeah. an autograph. So then Michael Ali wanted us to be buddies, and we exchanged numbers and we talked on the phone. But have you ever talked to someone who cannot? There's no conversation. He's just like one word or nothing. And God bless him. I wasn't understanding of that. Mm -hmm. And so I just stopped calling. And Ali, when I would go over, he says, hey, you talk to Michael? I said, Ali, I, I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I said, you know I'm a motor mouth, you know? Yeah. And I feel like I'm always, I'm, I'm, am I intruding on him, you know? So, but God bless him. He was never not nice. He was just, I could not, I wasn't patient. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the most famous person on earth. Yeah. Probably since Jesus Christ. I ain't gonna give him that. <laughs> well, since I'm not saying he's bigger, but yeah, I'm yeah. saying since he's one of yeah, he's one of them. He's yeah. definitely one of them. I mean, Ali was one yeah. of the other ones. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely one of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the show ended, and you know you started doing some sitcoms. Yeah, yeah. You know, you did Martin, so you yeah. got to reunite. Yeah, yeah. You know, with Martin yeah. Lawrence, uh, yeah. you did Soul Food. You did yes, uh, yes. the Steve Harvey Show. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, and then in 1992, Spike Lee called you uh, to be in Malcolm X. Oh, hell no. He didn't want to be in Malcolm X. No. Oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to be in Malcolm X. Everybody was trying to get into Malcolm X. And my agent and manager tried. And he, you know, he just said, no offense, that he's a comedian. He's a comic, you know, actor. And uh, so they couldn't get me in. I wanted to get in so bad. And so I had a friend, Montgomery Roberts, uh, who was a great actor. So... He pretended to be the manager. And Monty is, a, you know, he's Jewish and black. And so uh, Monty had this, he, he is, he can't be a butthole. And so he says, look, he says, white casting directors, have, Warner Brothers can see Ernest Thomas, but a black casting director can't see, a black director, you can't even give him the decency of a, a conversation. Okay, I know you don't want him in the, in the movie. But out of common courtesy, he's an icon to millions of black people, you know? So out of common, give the man five minutes of your time, just out of common. So with that, I could dress as a nation of Islam, have my, I have, you know, this suit I borrowed, you know, uh, this nice pea green suit, and I had shined my shoes. And, and, and working with nation from the nation, how I should look, the bow tie, I went looking like that. I went as the character. And Robbie Reed, uh, she said, well, you know, I, your manager is very rude. And I said, yeah, I'm going to get rid of him. I heard that a lot from a lot of other people, too, even though he was an actor. That was not true. And uh, so she said, well, while you're here, you know, why don't you go ahead and read anyway? So I thought they'd just been nice. And I read. And she went, OK, no emotion, like it was nothing. You know, but Robbie, that's how she does. She's just kind of give it. But... She's just trying to judge the performance and not trying to get emotional about it. Then I got a second call back. Oh, well, they're really being nice, you know, because Spike hires the same people, you know. If you look at this movie, you know, any of those guys could have played that role. So then they had me back with Denzel. It was the last time. And uh, I'm saying, oh, wow, this they're really going to let me down easy, you know. Well, at least I get a chance to do a thing with Denzel. And I, I saw do the thing with Denzel. And um, and as I'm leaving, Spike calls me and says, um, come back, you know, come back to the room. And he says, hey, you got the role, you know. Then I went crazy, just hugging everybody, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Okay, and you played uh, Sydney X yes. alongside uh, Denzel. Yes, yes. And, and honestly, to this day, I feel like... Uh, you know, that whole film got robbed at the Oscars. Oh, without a doubt. 
Without a doubt, man. Denzel should have won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the film should have won. That's the film. I, I, I agree. I yeah. agree. I, I feel like when when Spike Lee won the Oscar for Black uh, Klansman, yes. I felt like that was almost like an apology <laughs> for not giving it to Me him too. earlier on. It was like, I, I felt like that film was not Oscar worthy. No, yeah. And yeah, they were yeah. just like, all right, well, we yeah, messed yeah. up back then. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. I think like they did the same thing with, like Sidney Portier when yeah, they gave him like yeah. an Oscar for like what was it sneakers? Yeah. It was just like all right, we we'd been messing up all these oh, well, years. With, with Denzel, well, with Denzel, they gave him Training Day. Well, yeah, and when it should have been for Mal Malcolm. Uh, with Sidney was Lily of the Fields, yeah. uh, which he was real. That was new. That was that was like unheard of. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, especially being a dark skinned guy, and people were still being you know, uh, killed and hung and, and, mm -hmm. and, and in the South, you know, racism was at all time high, you know, in the sixties, but they only Hollywood. And that's what I love about our field. We paved the way, you know, we're ahead of the ministers. We're ahead of the pastors, the priests, the rabbis. We show the world how to be. Mm. If you notice that, you know, with with anti-Semitism, with with black with civil rights, with AIDS, with Phil, the film mm -hmm. Philadelphia, only Hollywood could tackle that and make people, but you know, put a Tom Hanks or put a Catherine Hepburn and a Spencer Tracy, mm -hmm. but guess who's coming to dinner to make yeah. sure with the interracial thing. We are always ahead of the game. So I just want to get a shout out to to the entertainment field. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, uh, you do that film. And then, I guess by 1999, you had moved uh, back in with your mother and your sister. Yeah, yeah. And was things kind of tough for you at that point as well? Yeah, well, actually, I actually moved in with a young lady that I was considering for a wife, um, uh, who was a great person, Inez Shahid. Uh, and then we decided that we're just going to be platonic. She said, "Well, look, you know, your mother is out here, but you know, you'll be distracted. So live, live with me." And so I was in South Central, you know, I, and that's when I found out the Crips and the Bloods and hmm. I didn't even know I was, uh, you know, no one bothered me, but I actually lived in South Central near Reverend Price's church there for three years, you know. Uh, and then I moved out, then, then I moved in with my mother in 2000, yeah. 2000. Well, I guess around 99, when you were in that situation, uh, people were saying that Chris Rock was trying to get in contact with you for a new show that he was doing. No, not th not then. I have, I met Chris Rock in Buffalo, New York. Uh, and that's when I was managing, trying to manage, this kid wanted me to manage him. He's now in Warner Brothers, Giovanni James. Uh, and so I, my mother thought that'll, that'll be a way of you getting off the drugs, go to New York. I'm trying to help this kid, but I'm still drinking, but not doing the drugs. In Buffalo, New York, staying with him and his mother so I could manage him. I hear about Chris Rock being at, oh, this is 89. He's at some local club there. And I go and see him. I went, man, you're a superstar, man. The people know you're this good. So we go to like a local club. We take photo. I have to actually have a photo from then, uh, from back then. And so then years later, you know, in 2005, mm -hmm. uh, when they saw that they, everybody, he's Chris, they said he was looking for me. I'm uh -huh. like, I didn't believe that was true because I, I don't know him, you know, uh, like that, you know, but they said, no, he's looking for you. So then he created this role, you know, um, of all the people, God bless them. God met everybody, everybody black that said, oh, Ernie, I got this for you. Martin Lawrence, I can do this, Eddie Murphy. And they, they mean well, they just never did. But Chris Rock, who never promised anything, you know, create, he and Ali Leroy created this role of Mr. Omar. And because of him, I'm known to the millennials, like mm -hmm. even today when I, I rented a car because my, my daughter wanted to use my car. Uh, and this Asian kid, you know, uh, he was asking where am I going? I said, well, have you heard of Balad TV? He said, yeah. I said, well, I'm on there, you know. What are you talking about? I said, I'm talking about my show, you know, uh, like what's happening and everybody's Chris. He said, wait a minute, you Mr. Omar, the guy from... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he put me on for the millennials. That That's, you know, it's a huge thing. Thank God. God bless him. Yeah, and you had a recurring role. Yeah, yeah, for four for, years. For four years. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Omar, the funeral director. Yes, yes, man, yes. Tragic, tragic! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Terry Crews was on that show. Yes, yeah. 
What do you think of some of the stuff that Terry's been doing recently? Oh, well, you had to ask me that. Well, yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, you know, I love I love Terry, and I think he comes from a sincere place. So when people call me, my cousin, she really has a thing like, "Why don't you talk to Terry Crews about what he <laughs> said?" And I said, "Well, he 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 means well. You know, I I um uh, I don't think that he's saying it from a thing of being uh, less than black. I think it's really uh, unfair to call him a coon and Uncle Tom. You know, he's saying that you don't want to get to to the point where you're saying black is, you know, superior." you know, uh, to white, you know? So I, I don't think he meant, you know, I know he had an acronym for the word nigga, you know, that well, people got upset I, I about. I think it was for Coon, actually. Huh? For Coon. I'm sorry? For, for he, he tried to use, he created a new acronym for the word. Was it Coon? Coon, yeah. Oh, okay, Coon. And, uh, you know, that was really, that, that I went like, okay. You know, <laughs> I didn't agree with it, but again, I know him, you know? He's a good guy, man. And he's just coming from like we are the world perspective to yeah. me. He he said that it should stand for conquer our own negativity. Yeah. Well, people made nigger. Look at what the rappers did with the word nigger. You know, Oprah doesn't use it. A lot of the older blacks who are established, they don't like that. But the 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 rappers, they made that positive. Well, I just hope that I'm just saying that the word "coon" does not become no. That, that one I can't. I, I, I really, no, I really I can't, hope I can't deal with the coon. No, that yeah, one. I, 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 I hope, can't I hope, make that. Yeah, I yeah, don't agree you with can't, that. You can't. You can't somehow. I can't agree with him on that. No, yeah, I can't. No. That, that, that was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's yeah, and no. you know, me and him have gone back, back and forth on Twitter before. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, I can't. He knows, no. he knows who not I am. Not coon. No, not coon. No. Have you had him on, Terry? I have not. Okay. But he he's got an invite if he wants to come. I'll I'll get into it with him. Yeah. We can do this. <laughs> that would be interesting. I'd love to see that one. Uh, me too. <laughs> me too. Uh, and then I think by 2009, at the end of the run, uh, for Everyone Hates Chris, Everybody Hates Chris was, uh, you got on the on the movie uh, Funny People. Yes. Uh, yeah. With Adam Sandler. Yes, yes. Where you played yeah. the principal. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Good guy, Adam Sandler, one of the nicest guys ever. Yeah. Well, uh, Quite a career, Thank quite you. a career with a lot Thank of ups you. and downs. Thank you. Uh, you know, there's a quote that you uh, you made at one point. You said, "A sure formula for success is an incredible faith in the Creator and in the God within you. Tunnel your vision on what you want. Get rid of all negative influences, including family, yes. but be kind with detachment. Yes. Best friends and frenemies. Yes. Work like you have only 24 hours to live. Yes. Laughter and comedy by any means necessary. Yes. Never." ever speak anything but greatness yeah. in your life no matter what your circumstances are yes. the only reality is the oneness with you and your creator yes you got it man <laughs> i love it thank great you. quote thank you uh, great thank great you. quote thank you. uh and you're 72 years old seven i will be 72 march 26 ah yeah. later this month yeah. later yeah, this later month, this month yeah. you know and you're completely lucid you. you know uh even with all the drugs yeah. <laughs> that you've taken does that yeah. sometimes surprise you how you kind of survived all that absolutely you know i i tell i said i wonder what would have happened if i hadn't done drugs for 20 <laughs> years maybe i will still look 40 you know <laughs> but yeah uh i'm amazed that all the nights you know that you go know, you up at night you know you get the puffy eyes and all yeah that my heart my health you know, all that you know i survived it thank god a lot yeah. of, I lost a lot of people. A lot of the pimps who I loved, you know, died or were murdered, you know. So, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, quite a career. And, you know, like we were saying before the interview started, uh, you know, I, I'm quite a bit younger. But growing up in the 80s, I was watching your show like every day after school. Oh, the syndication of it far outlasted yeah. the original primetime yeah. runs yes. that the yeah. show just lived on and somehow had a message that people related to. Yes. You know, yes. and it's still on still today. On. Still on today. Still on today. Still uh, just on. a great cast, very well written. Yeah. Um, you know, and really came at a time where there were not a lot of black shows. No. Like when, when yeah. What's Happening uh, came on, I mean, I guess the Jeffersons was already yeah. on. yeah. Good times. Uh, Good times was already on yeah. as well. And Sanford and Son. Sanford and Son. Yeah. That, and that was it. That was it. 
that was it. That was and it. you know, when you look at shows these days like Blackish and Oh, Mixish. You know, yeah, and you know <laughs> And the neighborhood. Yeah, and, Black yeah, AF like, oh, and, right, and all these. Right. I mean, so, they all pretty yeah. much are yeah. sitting on the shoulders of shows yeah. like What's Happening. Yes. They came before them. They showed yeah. America that you could have an all black cast yeah. and be appealing to the whole country. Yes. It wasn't just a black show no. for black people. No. It was something that everyone could everyone relate to. Everyone could relate to it. And I got that love from the hip hop. I didn't know until Tupac, when I met Tupac, ah. and he gave me that love. I thought they would think it's corny. Huh. Well, Tupac just hugged me, bear hugged me, said thank you for the laughter. And I'm like, I just, you know, I'm really looking at him like, okay, I know he's going to be whatever. And it was just the opposite. Then I met Method Man, Red Man, Queen Latifah, uh, MC Light, and all of them gave up. Of course, Will, Will Smith told mm -hmm. his kid, you know, Jaden, like, this is a guy I saw, I would watch every week. So I got a lot, you know, the hip hop, I had no idea how much they had embraced that show. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ernest Thomas, man, I yeah. appreciate you sharing Thank your you. story and uh, congratulations on Thank all your you. success and Thank congratulations you. on still being around and you look great. You look Thank healthy. You. You're Thank thin. You. Yeah, you know, yes. in the middle of COVID. Yeah, and you're not taking the vaccine. I'm not taking the vaccine, but I'm still working. I just did a film. I don't know if I can do that. Called the Playhouse. Okay. Um, uh, debuting April twentieth. Uh, so, but I haven't taken it. I had, I didn't take the flu vaccine after I got violently ill in 96. So I haven't had the flu shot since that time. Okay. So the same with the vaccine, I just gonna make sure I'm safe. You mm -hmm. know, but I don't want to get that saying. I don't knock people who take it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm always protecting myself and others. You know, I'm making sure yeah. way before the, the whole mask, I protected myself. I would not sneeze out loud, but it would irritate me to be somewhere where people just sneezed mm -hmm. or do this. What the hell is this? <laughs> it's still going out. Right, right. right. So, right <laughs> You're not stopping anything. Right yeah, now. you know? Well, Ernest, man, I appreciate you coming down. Thank All the you. best. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Take care.